Before I get going, I wanted to point out that a new book that I have published is now out. Check out the affiliate link below if you want to find out more. Big moments in history tend to be Velcro for myths about their creation. Whether it's George Washington and the apple tree, Julius Caesar having been born from a C-section, hence the name, or that Columbus actually discovered America and not the Caribbean. These myths just tend to grow. And while some myths are worse than others, invented to make things greater than they were, or created as just outright fabrications, many myths from history are a result of misremembered facts or misjudging the context of an earlier period of time. Right now, we're going to look at three of the myths about the King James Bible. Now, we are not going to be wading into a lot of the claims today by KJV-only folks or the counterclaims to that movement, but rather we're going to look at the broader myths, the myths that are often told in popular textbooks or just from time to time as would-be storytellers of history actually misjudge either the context or some of the facts as they occurred. So we don't want to say that these myths are pernicious lies or anything like that, but rather they misjudge the story. They overturn things. They stop us from noticing some of the nuance and the shading about the origin of the KJV. First, the myth is that King James was so opposed to Puritanism that he wanted the Bible in order to silence them. This myth is more of a problem of our popular recreation, I find, of the story of the KJV. This tends to happen mostly around the time of Thanksgiving. Things like school plays and parades during the Thanksgiving season are times when we usually hear about how religion was forbidden back in the old world and all these huddled masses yearn to breathe free. And so they put together some ramshackle chips and headed over the Atlantic. At times, it can actually sound like the Bible itself was stripped from the hands of believers. In fact, I remember my child taking part in a play in his pre-K days actually was the King James going around bonking everyone in the head and taking their Bibles. I've read popular accounts, though, that should know better, that tell of scores of people executed under Elizabeth I for the simple fact of being a Puritan. Elizabethan and Jacobian England start to sound a little bit like Stalinist Russia. Of course, we don't want to make light of persecution or even of oppression, but the situation in England was more about ending dissent than outright persecution, both under Elizabeth's reign and under the reign of James I. The Anglican Church, you have to understand, was clearly Protestant. Everyone knew it was Protestant. Later claims about Anglo-Catholicism or some kind of throwback as if Anglicanism had avoided Protestantism is a modern invention. The issues in the days of Elizabeth and James, though, were centered on worship. This animated not a few people. One fact I always point out to folks in order to tell them that what you're dealing with, however, are two versions of Protestantism, is that during Elizabeth's reign in the 1560s, when they were arguing about vestments, both sides actually cited the same sources against one another. Well, you haven't read so-and-so, and if you did, you would know that these vestments are wrong. Well, you didn't read so-and-so, and they said that they weren't wrong, but that they were a matter of conscience. So in the end, what is happening in the Anglican Church itself during these years is really more of a debate among siblings. And that doesn't make it irrelevant. It just means that what we're dealing with is not a dominant church that has an opposing theology or confession at its core. Rather, we're looking at different applications, and those can be very important things. But they don't make you utterly divided one from another. More importantly, the pilgrims who eventually made their way to this new world were not fleeing from James. They were sent. They were chartered. They were allowed to come. In many ways, what James began by allowing dissenters to leave is kind of separating the two squabblers. You go to the other side of the Atlantic, and when you're there, as long as you send trade back, well, then you'll be allowed to worship in whatever church you happen to build. Back here, it's Anglicanism. So when James is sitting there at the Hampton Court Conference, and he has not even been crowned yet, and he's already dealing with this Anglican versus Puritan fight, what he's dealing with is not a love of Anglicanism and a hatred of Puritanism. In fact, James had been king of Scotland, and Scotland was thoroughly reformed, and it had tossed out many of the liturgical and ecclesiastical practices that were endorsed and used in England. Rather, what James does is he sides with the established church. He realizes that he can't allow the dissenters 
to overturn everything that had only lately been established and protected. So one of James' famous quotes during this Hampton Court conference, no bishop, no king, or another way of reading that is no Anglicanism, no king. But you see, any politician would say the same then and now. I will not overthrow everything that is established. Reforms are to be done in a piecemeal and slow process, and you must follow the leadership. He's not going to allow the tail to wag the dog. So James does shut them down. He silences them in a way. But the way James silences them is in their complaining about worship. So when the myth says that King James opposed Puritanism and therefore lobbied or rallied for a Bible that eventually became known as the King James Bible or the Authorized Bible, that wasn't an oppositional move to Puritanism. In fact, it was the opposite. James said, look, I'm not going to get into this squabble about worship, and he actually makes fun of the Puritans at the conference. But it is, in fact, a Puritan himself who suggests that a way forward, a way to get off the subject of worship, would be to translate a new Bible. You see, both sides, Anglicanism with the Bishop's Bible and the Puritans or Reformed folks with the Geneva Bible, had actually brought in the Word of God as, you might say, a set piece in their fight. This is our Bible, and that's their Bible, and we will not use their Bible, this kind of a thing. So when James hears that he can put them all to work, translating a new Bible, he says, aha, this would actually work. This would actually be a good task since you both share a commitment to the Scriptures. In fact, one of the key features of the King James Bible shows this, the fact that in its 1611 printing, it has no notes, nothing. It has a title page, and it has the Bible. James specified that they were not going to use theological notes that were so common in other Protestant Bibles. So you see, the Bible, for King James, was not a point of sticking it to the Puritans, but rather of trying to get them to accommodate and have commonality and common ground with their Anglican opposition. Probably what's behind this myth are some half-remembered truths about the Wycliffe Bible being scorned and oppressed, or that Tyndale was executed for the translation of his Bible. That's about a century earlier for Tyndale, and far earlier than that when we go back to the story of Wycliffe. This is not the story of the King James Bible, though. No Bibles were taken out of their hands. In fact, long after the KJV was printed and established as the choice for English speakers, there were still published the other Bibles, the Geneva Bible, and so on. So what James is trying to do is not ruin Puritanism, but reform them and get them on to a more positive vision for the Church of England. Second is the myth that the Bible itself, the King James Bible, was authorized by the crown. This myth is, I think, due larger to the fact that we even call it the King James Bible in America, or it is known as the Authorized Bible in Britain. There is this long-standing legacy of saying that the Bible is somehow officially sanctioned by the crown. Now, the names are not bad. We're not going to get rid of them. It's going to be the KJV or the authorized version. However, the story is mislaid when we say that this is somehow required by the crown. James does influence the King James Bible, as I already said. He specifies that if they're going to be allowed to do this, then they must have no notes. And he had a couple of other small stipulations. But at no point does James sanction, specify, require, or demand that the Bible is officially the text of the Anglican Church. Rather, what he does is he does send a letter out asking that Anglican churches put a copy in every one of their congregations. Now, that's a tall order. The prices were a bit steep at the beginning. But you see, influence is not the same as authorization. In fact, the king never did this. The last English king to actually authorize a Bible officially was Henry VIII with his great Bible back in the 1530s. Ever since then, you have royal influence, but not royal sanction. The closest that comes to royal sanction is that one family, the Barker family, was given the copyright or the legal rights to print the King James Bible. Maybe that's where some of this myth comes from. You see that one person is given the copyright, and the assumption must be that, well, the king has the copyright and he loans that out to the publisher. That's more modern publishing than it is back in the 17th century. You see, to publish any Bible in England required this copyright, whether it was required or not. 
These are the Wycliffe Laws back from the Middle Ages and some others along the way that basically made it illegal without royal sanction to publish the Bible. Now, what James did not want was a series of adaptations or changes to the Bible that would rehash the debate, restoke the anger. And so, as was very common, he gave one copyright license to the Barker family. Two others were allowed to publish the King James Bible in the original, and that was the University of Oxford in Cambridge because of their long-standing tradition of training people in theology. You see, James was ultimately embarrassed to inherit a divided Anglican church. He wanted neither side to really feel like they won. And once he puts them on the road to translating the Bible, he very much is happy to see it succeed. But he doesn't do so by fiat or by some kind of authorization from the crown. And so while the name King James Bible or the authorized Bible will never go away, it is in fact not true that James did anything officially as the king. Third and lastly is this idea that the King James Bible was relatively untouched or altered until the rise of modern translations in the 1880s, with the publication especially of the RV or revised version. Now, this is a bit of a hot water subject. The KJV-only folks and those who counter the KJV-only folks love to get into the squabble about if the KJV ever changed. You'll meet all types of folks that are 1611-only, KJV-only folks, and there are others who argue that, in fact, there is no material change whatsoever over the course of the KJV's life, that it was sort of unblemished for 300 years. You can find all kinds of things online, frankly, about what constitutes a serious change in the text or not. To begin, we can say that there were some changes made. There were alterations, slight improvements, little things like this. We're not going to focus on the fact that sometimes printers published an errant text or they had errors themselves in the print run. That's common for the day. In fact, that's the story of the famous Wicked Bible, published actually by the Barker family, in which famously they forgot to put the word not and thou shalt not commit adultery, these types of things. And so the Wicked Bible was printed saying thou shalt commit adultery. Now, it was actually a tragic story. The Barker patriarch is actually thrown into prison for a while and pays a massive fine for doing this. So we're not talking about those types of changes. There are going to be typographical improvements or fixes, tweaks like that along the way. Those are not serious changes. There were, however, some changes that were more deep, you might say. Some of the language was fixed here and there. How much? Well, that's more in the eye of the beholder. I don't myself find that these changes later are ultra-radical. They're not flipping the text or modernizing it per se. So in many ways, the 1611 edition does more or less carry on. The problem in the debate amongst those who are KJV only in these things is that they only look at editions that are marked or labeled as the King James Bible. You see, when someone took the King James Bible in the New World in America, and updated it, and revised it, and changed its language, in almost no case is it printed with the name King James Bible. So, for example, John Wesley, famous founder of the Methodist movement, actually released a New Testament in which he revised the King James Bible to be in a refreshed English style. He also tweaked some of its theological nuances and things like this. But by and large, he said, look, the KGV is fine, but I need it to be in the language of the people. Wesley, of course, is on these evangelism circuits, leading lots of folks of low or no education to the faith, and he realizes that the King James Bible is just simply too highbrow, you might say. But see, that Bible is a revision of the King James Bible. It is foundationally the same, though it is only modernized. And there are a number of these, in fact, quite a few. So when we say that the King James Bible was unchanged, well, if you only look at King James Bible, so-called, well, that's certainly going to be the case. However, there was a movement afoot already by the 1700s, particularly after the founding of America in around 1776. After that, the King James Bible lost its copyright infringement policies. Why? Well, because America was no longer answering to the crown. That copyright that the crown had given to one family, and of course, by this point, it has gone from the Barkers to a different family, that copyright law no longer applied to the new nation. And so when folks wanted to update, revise, modernize the spelling or the wording of some places, they were free to do so. 
These Bibles would be printed under often a different name, but they were nevertheless an implicit, you might say charitable response to the King James legacy, not by trying to tarnish it and call it unworthy or any of these types of things, but rather to say we need to modernize it, we need English in the way that it is spoken now. And so in general, the implicit idea is that the King James Bible was already by the end of the 1700s beginning to lose its grasp in terms of its language with those who were there in the new United States. This is far more so in the 1800s, of course, and certainly by the end of the 1800s, when you see the revised version come out, much of their argument was not only a change in the foundational documents of the Greek, but also that the Bible needed to be in a language spoken now. So in a sense, that third myth is a truth and an untruth. True in the sense that if you only want to look at the KGV runs over the centuries, yes, never really changed all that much. But all around it, people use the King James Bible to create a new Bible that is essentially the same as the King James Bible with an updated language or an updated wording that was meant for the people. This is actually a long-standing tradition. The RV was not necessarily the first, but that's another video.